You, you who seek my knowledge. You wish to know my thoughts on the great adventure known as Bravely Default 2? Very well, but know this. Once known, it cannot be unknown. Ah, but you, you choose this path willingly. You choose to learn all, the entirety, and take it head on. You do not run from the truth when it is offered. You boldly face it and never falter in the process. To be brave, this is the way. Wow. I can't believe it's already been a couple of weeks since Bravely Default 2 came out. Square Enix's newest turn-based JRPG for the Switch. Crazier still, I've already beaten the whole thing. Yep, 60 hours, level 65 on final boss, true ending and all. God, I want to play more, but there's just so much I want to talk about too. Yeah, this is the best Bravely, and therefore makes it my new favorite game. And there's just so many reasons that I, I think, I think I'll just talk about well, everything. I just can't contain it any longer. I feel the need to rant about everything that makes me love this game. So I guess if you don't want to be spoiled on anything about Bravely Default 2, be it story, classes, boss fights, anything along those lines, click off now. Hmm. Maybe in another timeline I'd review this game without spoilers. <sighs> That's crazy. How could I not talk about in full detail everything that has made Bravely Default 2 my new favorite game. If you are new to the channel, a like and a sub would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Now this review is going to assume that you've probably already beaten the game and just want to hear my thoughts on it, but in the rare case that you're one of those people who don't mind spoilers and just want the full truth, then I should start off from the top. Real quick, Bravely Default 2 is the newest entry in the Bravely series, being the first game on the Nintendo Switch. And as for the title, if it's confusing you with Bravely Second, think of it like Final Fantasy. If Bravely Default, the original, is FF10, then Bravely Second is 10-2, and Bravely Default 2 is any other Final Fantasy game. It is a completely new experience, new story, new characters, new world, all of that. So you can jump right in without playing the previous games. We'll start off with the main component of the game. It's combat, naturally and it's just as good as ever. God, how I miss the Brave and Default system with defaulting to guard myself for the term and gain a Brave Point or BP, and then braving to spend those Brave Points and take extra actions on a turn, or better yet, risking it all and braving into negative BP and praying that combat is over before then, or else my team can't act for a while and we'll just get walloped by the enemy. Uh, it really does bring that freshness back into the turn-based genre. Now, combat has been mixed up a bit since the last two games. The most major of changes was the swap from full party planning to individual actions, like most other JRPGs. If you're hopping into this game from any other Bravely game without having played either of the demos, I imagine this could take some getting used to. I did play the demo, so I definitely had some more time to get used to it, but honestly playing Final Fantasy on stream helped a lot as well. The final game is honestly well adjusted to this new format with its pseudo ATB bars and all that and it feels better still than either of the two demos. And thankfully, you can still push the game to its limits. It's just that the broken builds, so far at least, seem more independent than relying on a complex mechanism between the entire party. But who knows, I'll probably find something in the near future that works. And overall, I feel like moving to the individual actions has balanced the game as a whole compared to the previous two. I was previously annoyed that you can't brave and use special attacks on the same turn anymore, but the power level of these attacks certainly feels like they've been raised, so it bounces out. There is one aspect of combat I'll be addressing later on, so I won't touch it just yet, but I just want to mention that it does make combat a bit annoying sometimes. But at the end of the day, I'm just so happy to be playing with this system again. God, it's so much fun! I remember during my first few hours of playing, there were just numerous times where I just smiled to myself as I braved and it felt good. I felt like I was home again. 
Now, if you're a Final Fantasy V Chad and haven't played one of these Bravely games before, you will probably be very interested in this next section. Yet again, Bravely returns with a miraculous job system, bringing with it 24 different classes for us to play with and customize to our liking, while allowing for a main job and sub job to use two sets of abilities at the same time in a battle. You want to use Red Mage with Arcanist, equipped with Moonbeam Shield and Subjob Specialty 1, so you can team cast Darkaga on the enemy with no reduced damage and not take any yourself? You can do that. You want to put Comeback Kid from the Dragoon on a Berserker and then use the super powerful Amp Strike three times and end with Vent Fury to put yourself in Berserk mode, only to be cleansed of it in two turns and have your HP and MP return to full? You can do that too. And of course, you're never limited to only one person having a job at a time, so you can go all out solve maker if you wanted. I don't know why you would do that, but you can. It gives the player a lot of freedom to create and play with various combinations as the series has done in the past. I mean, just go look where my channel came from. I grew up on YouTube making Bravely builds, so I'm glad I can mess around with the jobs in this game again. One thing they did that I think is interesting is how they made every class desirable in some way or other. Maybe it's not a class you're interested in actually using, but it more than likely has a passive that you want on one of your characters. How about 5% of your MP back every turn from the Arcanist's MP regen? Okay, I need to rant for a minute. The Brave Bearer is my new favorite job, hands down. The Exorcist was my favorite, and then they came out with this. Just what an amazing class to give us at the end of the game. It is so stupidly strong that it's actually worth leveling up just as you're on your way to the final boss. Like, Yokai and Bravely Second is cool and all, but it was just way too much work for like jackal rewards right at the end of the game. So you were better off just fighting Providence with the kit that you had. Brave Bearer though? It's not only super strong with moves like party-wide damage based on how much health you currently have or attacks that are stronger the longer you've played the game, but it actively promotes extremely fast level and job grinding, so it's absolutely worth getting for the final fight. Brave Bear just feels like one of many love letters this game gives to Bravely fans, and it's just beautiful. Alright, let's move on. Reducing the number of jobs to 24 compared to 30 in Bravely Second really showed just how loose the latter's cases were, and just how much tighter and cleaner they could have been made things. Because now, like I said, each class has something useful to it, whether you're actually going to use it or if you're just grabbing a passive or two to make another build much better. So that's one thing I really enjoyed. And as stated earlier, there's still some absolutely broken builds you can do in this game. If you're afraid that's not possible anymore, don't worry, it most certainly is. Another nice touch is that the base stat line for all four party members this time around are the same, so you can literally set the party up however you want. In previous games, the characters had stats that leaned them towards certain roles, but now you can do whatever you want and then improve each person accordingly with the booster buns you can earn as early as the prologue. It's nutty and I love it. The one thing I'll say that was a bit annoying and tedious for a while was the grind. And trying to do the traditional manner of just fighting everything you see and not doing anything else yielded very slow results. Eventually I figured out that the monster treats are the way to go for the majority of the game's playtime. Seriously, these things are extremely good. Consecutive battles boost you so fast in this game, and the great thing about them is that the number of combats are random when using this item, so you don't have to get a first turn clear every time to keep it going, and it keeps people from chaining 99 battles together and then just getting a ridiculous amount of resources. It's just fair and balanced, as it should be. And then once I had the Fount of Knowledge unlocked, I just spammed Brave Bearer in there, and I could max a job on someone in like 30 minutes or less thanks to the Queen Wiki Wikis. Even then, there were times where I was aching for Octopath's job system so I could just get whatever I want when I want it, but this is just the traditional manner of class leveling, so it's whatever. Neither great nor horrible. Since we're still on the subject of gameplay, let's just include the other aspects of actually playing the game into this section, again save for one thing that I'm saving for later. Now previous games always had the nice big world for us to travel over and explore, but Default 2 has gone and created a much richer open world experience. In the same vein as Octopath, I absolutely adore adored the ability to wander physically across Excellent from place to place, to have to travel between the kingdoms and experience a relatively realistic journey. 
I love the changing overworld themes in each zone. They're all really nice, and God bless the developers for going with avoidable encounters. Not only does the world feel more full, having all the monsters actually there with you to engage at your own pleasure, but I also feel that the set random encounter format is tired and annoying, so good on them for moving forward. Plus, you got all the different ways combat can occur based on who starts it, which is really cool. And it makes you pay attention when grinding instead of just starting encounters mindlessly. And then the dungeons feel less annoying in general when you aren't being stopped every five feet with a random encounter. Oh, and the dungeon designs are pretty nice. They all look pretty cool and distinct from one another, with some interesting layouts and even some simple puzzles here and there. My favorite was the Fount of Knowledge, with all the memories of your travels showing up around you as you explore this mystic fairyland. It was super cool. Back in the overworld, there's more to do than just traveling around, though. You can find loads of chests with good items, hidden little groves, and, well, I guess this had to be brought up eventually. The lawn mowing simulator is actually pretty useful. Being able to cut tall grass like in Zelda yields some really good rewards that actually scale with your party's level, so it stays relevant as a method of gaining items throughout the entire playtime, which is awesome. And to make the early game even easier, you've got Forage on the Freelancer, which just gives you free stuff during combat, like potions and such. There's also tons of side quests for you to do, and they all serve really important purposes. Some give really good equipment, others follow up on what previously defeated asterisk holders are doing, and then you have the really awesome ones that flesh out the party's relationships and let you learn more about each person. And ah, they're just... They're so wonderful! There's this one side quest where you just walk along a beach with Gloria and talk, and it's just so nice. Two more activities worth mentioning are Exploring and B&D. The former is this game's town building simulator replacement, so you can still get items while not playing the game. You just go boating and put your switch in sleep mode, go to bed, and wake up to some new booster buns and orbs, the latter of which gives stuff like JP and experience when used. I just wish that Seth wouldn't wander around so much and find more things by the time I woke up, but I suppose there's so many ways of obtaining this kind of stuff that, again, it balances out. B&D, on the other hand, is a good pastime if you want to break from level grinding and play an area control card game against some opponents. It's pretty fun and has some interesting mechanics that take time to learn, and I want to mess around with it some more in the near future. I think Bravely Default 2 is a visually fine game. It doesn't scream best of the best here, but I still like how it looks personally. I can understand if people don't like the character models, that's fine, but I think it's an interesting blend between the original chibi style of Bravely Default and the full render cutscenes. The job outfits are what I really like. They all look so cool and unique on everyone. My personal favorites were the Monk and Brave Bear. They just look so awesome and sleek. The environments look nice too, and they both have enough open space to run around in while not feeling like a sandbox map containing cool details and places to go here and there. In towns, they brought back the visual style of having it look like you're running around on a watercolor painting, and I'm so happy they kept that. It's just absolutely breathtaking. It's even cooler now because you have this dynamic camera that takes on different angles depending on where you run around in the cities. Monster designs are fine, just typical, solid, bravely enemy designs. Later boss designs like Edna and the Knight's Nexus are pretty cool though, particularly the latter. I love the idea of a mummy wrapped up in bandages and then having it become unraveled for its final form. It's just simplistic and thematic and it takes me back to Ares' butterfly evolutions. I like it. Effects in battle kick ass and the budget on special animations got a bump. They all look incredibly badass. Only complaint I may have is on some of the animations and camera angles for certain moves, like during Bernard's fight where the camera operator was hopped up on like 30 cups of coffee and had the worst case of the jitters ever. It just hurt to look at here and there, but that's not the case of all the animations. On the other end of the spectrum, Recurring Nightmare from the Phantom has the coolest animation of them all. I just love the, the cutting with the hands and the whole screen splits. Oh, damn, is it good. Ah. Uh, what a good effect. Yes. Just. Yes. Revo is back and you'd better believe he's written another absolute masterpiece of a soundtrack. While I would say this one is less fairy tale like than defaults, I honestly believe this one's better. Seriously, I'm breaking free of my nostalgia for default soundtrack and saying it. This game's music is better. Not only is it 
written better. It has an absolutely new personality to it. And there's even more of it. It's insane. The new personality fits this new world, new story, and new characters perfectly. And yet still manages to hit notes and callbacks to songs from default without completely reusing them. When I was fighting Edna and the wicked flight motif kicked in, and then it was followed up with that beautiful triumphant theme, not to even mention having Adele and Magnell's theme built in as well, I just barely held myself back from crying. It was so beautiful. The music was the only thing keeping me from giving up on that boss so easily at times, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a pleasurably punishing fight. Just another example of this game's almost romantic-like gestures to series fans. Then you got the special themes and, oh my god, look, Love's Vagrant is good, but it still can't match up to the level of recognition and personality that any of the special themes in this game has. They are so befitting of the characters and are instantly recognizable and they just feel so right. Dude, they're so good. And speaking of combat, can we talk about how many freaking battle songs Revo made for this game? The man has fully earned every bit of praise I can give, just based on this part of the soundtrack alone. Two normal combat themes, a rare monster song, six different Astros Holder themes, yes you heard me, six Edna's theme, and the three different themes for the Knight's Nexus. I might have even missed something because there's just so much- oh wait, there! I just remembered the super wicked panic theme that plays during the wave combats against Holograd soldiers when you're defending Rheimdahl or escaping the Halcyonia prison. Add that one to the books. And not a single one of these themes is bad, and they all fit their fights so well. And you got the final boss theme that has 11 light motifs with a bunch of the boss themes and the character themes and the game's main theme and just, and yes, yes, this song is just as good if not better than Serpent Devouring the Horizon. There, I said it. The songs of the towns are great. They really match the tone of the city, be it from the wintry atmosphere of Rheimdahl to the fiery, industrious realm of Holograd. And even cooler, the overworld theme changes when you enter a new realm. That's so cool. There was one dungeon theme that actually had me head banging the first time I heard it. It was the indoor building dungeon theme that played in the abandoned mansion outside of Savalon. And let's not forget our good friend, the airship theme. Ah, oh, and the villain's theme. What a smooth track. Just every time I hear it, I'll always think of the shock I felt as Castor cut down Bernard in chapter one. Ah, oh, just such wonderful music Revo has made. I just can't do the soundtrack enough justice in talking about it. There's not enough positive adjectives in the world to do it. It is that good. So probably the only topic I'm kind of mixed on is the game's difficulty. I both really like and really dislike how hard this game is, so let's go over why that is. First point, in case it wasn't obvious, this game is hard. Like, a lot harder than Default or Second. Hell, probably harder than both of them combined. The main reason for this is the new counter ability that 99% of enemies have, bosses included. Now, enemies have the ability to rack to pretty much anything you do. You attacked, they counter. You healed your party, they counter. You used an item, they counter. You breathed, they counter. In regards to being against this, there were a number of occasions where I felt like, this is bullshit. Sometimes counters will feel super arbitrary, like they come out of nowhere, or like hyper-specific in how they proc. Or they're on the other end of the spectrum and have extremely broad parameters for activating, like counter any ability on any howl during your last 25%. So you got these somewhat annoying counters to deal with, and those are just sitting on top of fights that can already be difficult enough as it is. Gladys, I get it, you can attack my party six times on a single turn and more than likely wipe me with that alone. Why do you need counters on top of that? I played through the game on normal and I was having a hard enough time as is, I can't even imagine the poor souls who took hard mode. Lord of Dragons, watch over you all. The big problem with this isn't so much that it's hard for series veterans, but that it will probably chase away newcomers to the series with how brutal some of these fights can be, which seems to be one of the things Nintendo is trying to do with this game, bring in new fans I mean. But from another point of view, I thought the increase in toughness was actually pretty welcome. 
Having played the previous games, it was a nice boot in the rear compared to default and second that made me realize that I had to really get good with this one if I wanted to get through. And so I had to learn, I had to optimize, and I was pushed to the limit in nearly every boss fight. And it felt great. It was satisfying that my bravely knowledge didn't just let me walk all over this game, that I had to apply that knowledge to the best of my abilities and even then still be vigilant in order to progress. It's a game that genuinely challenges you, and if you know what you're doing, or keep trying different strategies out, then you will get through it eventually, even if that means switching strats in the middle of the fight itself. When I got to the Berserker fight, I was like, damn, I think I was supposed to level grind a little bit before taking this on, but instead, I persisted and I was able to defeat Caster at level 15. And those kind of wins feel amazing. The victories against foes that keep you on the brink of death at all times, and that you barely come back from. I mean, look at the final fight against the Knight's Nexus. This thing can literally take all of your party's MP in a single attack, and that's just one of the multiple bastard moves it can do. And yet the relief that comes once you beat it is very powerful, and you actually feel like you've accomplished something. I also feel like the bosses actually brave more often compared to previous games, so it certainly makes it harder when the boss is actually meeting you at your level. So at the end of the day, I don't mind the difficulty increase, though I also wouldn't blame people if they found it a bit too punishing. This is the part I've been waiting for. For as much as I love the music, the combat, the gameplay, and everything else I've said so far, this is my favorite part. Default and Second, they're both great in their own rights, but neither of them were able to make me cry. Yes, Default 2 brought tears to my eyes, at how absolutely stunning the story and characters were. You might get the impression that having watched all the trailers for this game might have spoiled you, and you'd be completely wrong. They managed to conceal so many twists and turns that I never even saw coming, and they were all enjoyable as hell. The first few hours were a little slow, but I figured they were just setting things up, getting the pieces in place and whatnot. And then I got to where Castor slays Bernard, and suddenly I was thrust into this absolutely incredible story that had me completely and utterly absorbed in what was going on. This game may not be as fairy tale like as I feel was the case with Default and Second, but it's just such a more interesting story. It takes the Final Fantasy formula and perfects it. And on top of that, it makes the job system an active key part of the story by having the asterisks be a main plot point. The story is also way darker than the previous two games, and it treats its subject matter with the seriousness it deserves. And this time around, Asano and team have perfected the loop. What do I mean by that? Well, each Bravely game thus far has had some form of loop involved that ties together the story and the gameplay. In default, you had to awaken all the crystals five times in order to get the true ending. In second, you had to start a new game plus and activate Bravely second during the opening fight to push past chapter one and go into chapter five. However, default was incredibly tedious and second, while cool, is easy to avoid the loop and such you don't really experience it. Default 2, however, has gone and perfected it. Instead of retreading old ground, this time we reach an unsatisfactory ending, and so we go back a bit and try a different route, and then we fail again, and so we go back, fighting on against fate until we manage to change it and reach an outcome where everyone gets to live happily ever after. So there's no tedium in what we're doing since we never redo the exact same thing, and it feels like we're actually changing fate, which just pulls you into the character's plight even deeper. And speaking of the characters, dear God, this is my new favorite cast. I love the Warriors of Light, don't get me wrong, but this group, the Heroes of Light, this group is so compelling and interesting and entertaining and their chemistry is absolutely perfect. And they have such good growth over the course of the game. Like, Anya's is all right, but she still kind of sticks to the my only purpose in life is to serve the crystals stick pretty hard. Gloria does that too. But we see even more of her friends trying to crack open her shell to get her to relax and smell the roses here and there. There's literally two whole side quests that I can recall dedicated to this, and both of them made me so happy. Like, just a side quest of walking along a beach and having Seth and Gloria talk to each other. 
That's good. That's nice and fun character building, and it's sweet seeing them together. And Seth, let's talk about the best main character for a minute. Yes, you heard me. Seth has so much more character than Tiz or you. I'm sorry it hurts to hear that, but let's be bluntly honest here. He barely has anything known about his past, and yet the single fact that he's a sailor is used and brought up in discussion so much more than Tiz being a shepherd or you being a scholar. He even says yar har har in combat for crying out loud. I love it. And best of all, this game firmly cements the player's place in the party. I actually felt invited in this time, like I was really there alongside the party. Not only because of how good the writing was at making me care, but how we actually affect the party this time. How we are needed to destroy the Nexus's memory. How we bring back Seth's memory. And how the letter P lingers after the credits. Probably in reference to the final chapter being named Twin Pages. And each letter of Pages represents a member of the party. That kind of recognition is wonderful. And it's why those who assemble stars in the darkness is better than Serpent for me. Because when you get all those motifs in the final boss theme, it truly feels deserved. Having gone through so much pain and heartbreak, finding the right path to a bright new future with the party, not just watching them from afar as a celestial being, this time you are a member of the party. We are a main character in the world, and it feels magnificent. And let's not forget the supporting cast, or our villains. All the bad guys are really interesting in their own rights, and they're all fairly well written. I think I could have gone for a little more in Adam and Edna's departments, but at the end of the day, I'm okay with what I've got. And I'm also happy the evil god doesn't come out of nowhere this time. The Knight's Nexus is established as a main threat from the very start, so it's kind of satisfying when that is the true enemy in the end. And overall voice performances for everyone? Pretty good. I like the voice acting a lot. I think the actors put a lot more emotion into their roles, and they represent the characters well. Some performances are better than others, certainly, but I think for the most part, the English acting is solid. The accents help too, gives the world some more flavor. Now combine the story and the characters and what's left to talk about, the cutscenes. And yet again, I love these cutscenes. Fully voice acted, unless it's clearly a party chat, which has always been text-based, and just amazing framing all the time. I love the camera movements and placement so much. It's a small difference that makes things so much more impactful. My favorite example of this has to be at the end of chapter 6, where we have Elvis and Adele saying their last words to each other, and the edge of the frame that separates them is where the barrier of magma lies, and the dialogue is just so good, and I love, love, love this game! Ugh, I, I couldn't help but tear up at this moment. The whole plot is immaculate, and it just kept prompting me to keep playing, never stopping just here because I gotta find out what happens next, and then one chapter turns into two, and so on. It's just so enjoyable. You have to experience it for yourself to understand. Now, there are some plot points that are left a little bit untied, but I think that may be good to either set up for a sequel, which please give it to me, or it requires deeper exploration and lore hunting in the game, which I plan to do as soon as I'm done this review. And the fourth wall stuff wasn't as blatantly obvious this time. It's much more subtle and you gotta think about it a bit more, but it makes it fun when you have those kind of revelations. Like when you realize that the Knight's Nexus couldn't be killed because it made its own save file and was just reloading its save every time it lost, so it took you, the player, overwriting that save to finally stop it. You know, stuff like that. It's fun. This game's plot and characters are my new all-time favorites, and I pray for a sequel or prequel. Just take me back to excellent. After I finished Default 2, I went off to watch some footage of the original Default to compare them. And what I realized was these are two very different feeling games, and they're both excellent. The first default has a more fairy tale feel to it, but default 2... <sighs> default 2 is something else. Each game gives me a different kind of good feeling, and they both have their own charm to them. Both make me happy, but this new one makes me happier. Bravely Default 2 may be a brand spanking new entry into the series, completely unconnected to the others, but it is a welcome return for series veterans and new players alike. It simultaneously manages to feel like home sweet home for Bravely fans and a fresh new experience. The amount of callbacks to the series and the numerous tributes it pays to other staples of the genre, particularly Final Fantasy, 
are beautifully woven in without obstructing or distracting from the game. I went in with big expectations and came out absolutely blasted away. Every expectation was met and surpassed. I could not have asked for a better game. In just under one week of play, it has become my new favorite game, and I already want to play through it again. If this were to be the last game of the Bravely series, this would be a happy send-off, a love letter for us, the players. I pray this is not the case, though, and I doubt this will be the case. I see a future where this franchise continues, growing and expanding far beyond what it is right now, and yet, at the same time, I have no earthly clue how they could top this game. This was some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. Bravely Default was my favorite game. Now Bravely Default 2 has taken its place, and I can't wait for the future to come where a new Bravely awaits to claim that title. Thank you for watching this Brave edition of my Bravely Default 2 review. If you want to share a non-spoiler version of this review with someone, check out the default edition on my channel. It basically goes over the same points without a single spoiler. Let me know what you thought of the game in the comments section below. If you enjoyed the review, then a like and a sub are always welcome and appreciated. Thank you for watching, have a lovely day, and I'll see you soon.